the antibody drug conjugates, um, come, right. oh boy, there's a lot going on in that space these Certainly days, is. you know. Um, what were some of the updates, you know, from ASCO in, in that regard? Right, so I think we're all used to TDM1 and the HER2 space, which is our first and very important prototype antibody drug conjugate, but we now have a lot of second generation or the next generation antibody drug conjugates, either looking at different targets or looking at different cytotoxic payloads. And I think an important feature is that you want an attractive target which is preferentially you know, present in the tumor tissue and not really in the normal tissue, which is the first step that you think about when you're thinking about a new antibody truck conjugate. And I think the one that definitely st is striking and comes to mind is the one that uh, was presented by Aditya Bardia. So this was with sasituzumab jovitican, and this is an antibody truck conjugate against the target trope 2, which is a cell surface glycoprotein. And in triple negative breast cancer, where he presented the data last year, and actually we have breakthrough approval by the FDA in, in that setting, um, it's present in more than 90% of the tumor tissues, but it's also present in other epithelial tissues. And so this year at ASCO, he presented data specifically in the subset with hormone receptor positive disease, which was interesting. So this was a smaller subset compared to the triple negative subset, which was about 110 patients, the triple negative subset. And the overall response rate there in the third line setting, at least three prior lines of chemotherapy or more than third line setting, was about 34%. When we looked at the hormone receptor positive subset, the overall response rate was about 31% also. And these patients have received three lines of hormonal therapy. They've received two lines of chemotherapy before they got this agent. And so I think this is uh, certainly an upcoming and attractive um, molecule or antibody drug conjugate even for this particular. What was also important, we keep talking about CDK4-6 inhibitors, specifically 70% of the patients here, 17% I should say, had received prior CDK4-6 inhibitors before they got sasituzumab, and the response rates there were still 24%. So perhaps some suggestion that there is still activity even in patients who have progressed on CDK4-6 inhibitors. So we'll see what more data shows in, in that space. Uh, a really in, attractive payload, you know, with the topo one, topo one um, Absolutely. In, inhibition, because we the, know very mm -hmm. well there's a, there's a track record, and we just don't have that readily available for, for our patients, very highly non-cross resistant. So the phase three going on in the triple negative population is really, really important uh, versus treatment physician's choice, chemotherapy, later line. Yeah, it is. The primary toxicity of this uh, treatment is neutropenia, which generally we can manage. So I think that's really encouraging as well. It's intriguing to me that this ADC, along with another ADC, which is entering phase two, the Seattle Genetics uh, ADC against LIV1A, uh, both cause hair loss, yeah. uh, which, you know, uh, yeah. TDM1, trastuzumab, amtansine didn't and so, and doesn't. So it's really interesting. I mean, there's something different about the linker and the toxin, and people do lose their hair, although some of our patients who are on the Seattle Genetics study have used uh, scalp cooling and haven't lost their hair, so hmm. there you go. They're not dosed very frequently, and uh, hmm. sasituzumab dose day one and eight, as opposed to the LIV1A, which is every three weeks. So it'll be interesting. I mean, the trope two is so uh, universally expressed that I think it's, it makes a very attractive target. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, ladirituzumab, the, the LIV1, um, you know, antibody drug conjugate also with a, 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 a anti-tubulin a pay, payload, right. you know, MMAE. but M MMAE, right? But uh, very, um, very powerful. And going forward now with checkpoint inhibitor being added yeah. to it, you know. Yeah. So and going into I spy two, right? It's in, already in I spy two. Already in yeah. I spy two mm -hmm. in the preoperative setting. So wow, really, really rapid, you know, yeah. trans translation. Um, so speaking of the checkpoint inhibitors, um, Dibu, what's going on there in the in the triple negative? population. Just give us an update. Well, a, a lot is going on. Uh, the initial studies were, were somewhat promising, and uh, but even though res the response rates were low, but as, as they broadened out to treat uh, larger populations, we saw response rates even in triple negative were in the 5 to 10 percent range, even lower in hormone receptor positive. And the monotherapy uh, or, or first-line therapy study, uh, Keynote 86, uh, presented at San Antonio by Sylvia Adams uh, showed that um, in first-line therapy the response rate was 23 uh, percent, uh, and um, these uh, and this was a large uh, uh, 266 patient trial. 
So I think this is going to give us the opportunity to, to, to dissect a little bit more what, which patients respond. In contrast to some of the other uh, tumor types, it's been hard to discern whether there are clear predictive factors, uh, such as PDL1. Um, it seems maybe that the immune infiltrates and in their character may be more important. Hope can probably comment a little bit on this. She's been very involved in these. And I'll just briefly say that some of the, we're awaiting some of the other studies, uh, randomized studies, for example, the, the Impassion um, 130 study, the nab paclitaxel plus or minus a tezolizumab will be out uh, soon, hopefully, and um, uh, that's going to be very important because here we're looking at uh, uh, clearly an effective therapy and one that may actually enhance uh, uh, the immune response, so uh, we're all looking forward to that. Yeah, the, you know, the interesting thing about the keynote trial in the first and then second or greater line setting was it was a large trial. We treated uh, a little under 90 patients, 86 patients in the first line setting, and that's where this response rate that was, you know, uh, just under 25 percent, you know, in the 23 to 24 percent range was seen. But so intriguing, just like the phase one trials that had very few patients where we thought the response rate was higher in later line therapy. You know, the response rates in later line therapy were less than 5% in that group. But then when we looked at the atezolizumab dose expansion, they showed the exact same thing. They had less patients in the first line setting, response rate almost identical to the keynote trial. And in the second or greater line setting, those patients also had a very low response rate uh, in, in almost the same range. And you know, both studies showed that tumor infiltrating lymphocytes uh, were correlated to some degree with response, but tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, fascinating thing, are gr much higher overall the earlier you are in your disease setting. So that if you're in the first line setting, you have more than later line, and then that predicted, uh, you know, the response, where the responses numbers are smaller here, where you have a lot of TILs, your responses were even much higher, which over 30%. Uh, also, there's some data that suggests that the number of TILs predicts the pd one status, which may be why we're so crummy at associating pd one status with response. It's really because TILs are something we can see in more real time than pd one I mean, we have very variable data, not something to be used at all to select checkpoint inhibitor therapy for patients with breast cancer right now, at least in my opinion. Uh, but uh, the then there, the idea is that if you could increase the TILs, you would have even a better response, or if you treated very early in the course of therapy. And, you know, we don't know. There's a lot of randomized trials now that are suggesting uh, that are looking at this in the neoadjuvant uh, setting. And then uh, there, there was, I, I'm curious what people thought about the tonic trial that Maureen Koch has been working on. And uh, that was updated at ASCO, also looking at a variety of different two-week inductions with low-dose radiation and low-dose chemotherapies to see whether or not you could enhance the response. The numbers are very, very small, but the responses look better than what we've seen with checkpoint inhibitors. But we've got to be cautious given our phase one results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. And of course, the preoperative setting is extremely exciting, you know, with the, with the checkpoint uh, inhibitors. And, and hopefully, you know, in the ongoing pembrolizumab preoperative uh, study, we will have, you know, we'll have a good new therapy for, for patients. We certainly hope so. It's enrolling very, very well, um, for sure. So. Um